completely out of me. Man, what a beautiful day. Hi everyone and welcome back to my video series where we disprove evolution. This is part 5. If you haven't seen the first four parts, click on part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. And while you decide what you want to do, I'm just going to go ahead and look at the pretty blue sky. Look at that. Ain't that something? Seriously, go ahead and click on the screen if you want to watch one of the earlier videos. Welcome back. All right, before we begin, I want to give you a few more links to geological evidence of the flood. I can't really present to you everything I want to in a 10-minute video, so at the bottom of your screen there, uh, you'll see a bunch of annotations. And if you don't see them, that means you're not actually on my original profile page. Many people like to copy my videos, but when they do that, they don't get the annotations. So if you want to search for my original profile page, Venom Fang X, make sure the spelling is correct, uh, you'll get the video with the annotations. So let's, uh, let's continue with what I promised we would talk about in the last video. We're going to talk about how big was Noah's Ark? How many animals did Noah have to bring on the Ark? And did we find Noah's Ark in the mountains of Ararat like the Bible said we would? Yes, we did. The Bible says that the Ark would rest in the mountains of Ararat in the outskirts of Turkey. This is Turkish for Noah's big boat. In 1960, they discovered what they thought to be Noah's Ark. In 1978, on the same site, there was an earthquake which exposed Ark ribs, or deck timbers. The government there is 100% confident in this being Noah's Ark. They even built a visitor center there. Using radar scans, they found this to be a seagoing, man-made vessel made of complex parts. Its location and size directly matches the biblical account of Noah's Ark. On the site were found massive anchor stones, with holes in them, obviously for rope. These would have been used as drogue stones, weighing the boat down in order to withstand incredible waves as well. It would have been able to align the boat perpendicular to the waves in order to keep upright. They also found at the site metal rivets which held the Ark together. This puppy was nearly two football fields long, 515 feet. That is approaching the size of the Titanic. Okay, I'm going to put this into a neat little package for you. Uh, we showed you that you did not evolve from bacteria. Uh, you did not come from the zoo to the goo to you. We showed you there was a worldwide flood. We just showed you Noah's Ark. And now, uh, I mean, what else, what else do you want? Did you know that every major nation on the planet has an existing flood legend? There are over 270 of them. The Chinese have the story of Fu Hai, who they consider to be the father of their civilization, who got on a boat with all the animals on the planet and survived a worldwide flood. The Toltec Indians have a story of a man who built an ark and had all the animals on there with him, survived a worldwide flood. Hmm. The Babylonians had a story about a worldwide catastrophe, a flood, where a man and his family got on an ark with all the animals, and they repopulated the planet. Interesting, isn't it? Maybe it's not a legend. All right, enough about Noah's Ark. I think you get the point. How many animals did Noah have to bring on the ark? Did he have to bring a billion animals on the ark? The answer, I've said before, is no. People like to say, how, you know, did he have to bring every species? No. The Bible says he brought every basic kind. So now we're going to have to define what is a kind. Well, any booger-picking moron can tell that a dog is a dog is a dog, and it's not a banana. So some people say at this point, how many dogs, then, did Noah have to bring on the ark? Do you really expect me to believe that all the dogs on the planet came from two dogs on Noah's ark? Well, I suppose that's better than believing that all the dogs on the earth came from bacteria, and that the bacteria came from a rock four billion years ago. And no, Noah didn't have to bring two dogs, because I said Noah had to bring two of every kind. Now, what if there's more than one kind of dog? That would explain why we have so many varieties of dog today. So let's first define what a kind is, because I said that Noah, and the Bible says, that Noah had to bring two of every kind. So what exactly is a kind? The easiest way to define a kind is anything that does not share a common ancestor with something else. That means with indistinct families, like birds or dogs in this case, there can actually be different kinds of dogs within the overall umbrella of dogs. That is to say, God created originally a few different kinds of dogs. 
Now here we see a mock-up chart that the evolutionists have made that say all the dogs on the planet are related. Now I don't believe this to be true. In order for this to be true, all the dogs on the planet would have to share a common ancestor. And that dog would have to come from some kind of monkey fish frog. <laughs> But on a more serious note, I don't believe that the dogs we see today all share a common ancestor, or rather, the original kinds did not. So allow me to make my point. In this chart, we can see that the dogs actually don't share a common ancestor, not all of them. And there was about four kinds of dogs on Noah's Ark. Now, there might have been more. Hey, there might have been less. I don't know. However, I do hold that Noah's Ark existed that Noah brought dogs on his ark, and that all the dogs we see are from dogs that were on Noah's ark. So the only other question is, the evolutionist looks at this and says, well, isn't that evolution? Isn't, aren't these dogs who are making all these different varieties of dogs, isn't that evolution? Only if you don't know how to use your brain. <laughs> you know, crossbreeding. You know, if you take one type of dog and you give it to another type of dog, you're going to come up with a whole bunch of crazy varieties. On top of that, God gave the ability to life in order to adapt. What that means is, that doesn't mean it's going to grow a new limb out of its forehead or something. Uh, it just means that a dog was created with fur, and God allows the dog, in order, uh, in order to survive in a whole bunch of different situations, it has the ability, through uh, successful generations, in order to grow thicker or thinner fur, maybe bigger paws with slightly bigger claws, or, you know, we talked about this with Darwin's finches. So, adaptation is not evolution. Crossbreeding is certainly not evolution. You know, I was speaking with an evolutionist who said this. I have evidence for evolution. So I said, okay. And he said, uh, I have a bacteria that is uh, resistant to antibiotics. So I said to him, okay, so what did it start as? He said, a bacteria. I said, what did it end as? Uh, bacteria. Uh -huh. So I asked him this. Is it possible that God designed bacteria and, and all life uh, with the ability to adapt within limitations without ever changing its basic kind, and he never gave me an answer. You see, the evolutionists look at these small variations and they say, well, over billions of years, that'll eventually uh, turn into something else. Now, have they ever observed that happening? They say, no, 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 it'll take a million years to observe it. So they're admitting they've never observed that happening. Now, science is defined by things we can test, repeat, and observe. So for them to say these small little variations, which totally fit with the creation model that God designed life with the abil ability to adapt, how, how can you possibly say this is evolution? You have to be an idiot. It started as a dog. It ended as a dog. It started as a fish. It ended as a fish. It started as a human. It ended as a, you guessed it, a human. All right, let's lay down a few facts here. They've never seen evolution happen, which is why they say it takes billions of years. You say, show me evolution, they say, ah, uh -uh, can't, it'll take me a few million years. Well, that's convenient. I could say that my, uh, my boxers are going to turn into briefs over billions of years, but you're going to have to wait. You know, you can always tell when something's a fairy tale, when people say, long ago and far away, this happened. That's not science, my friends. We've never seen evolution, and by them saying that it takes that long to happen, that you can't show any contemporary examples, even though everything should be in a constant state of evolution. There is not one, not one animal or plant on this entire planet that exhibits any additional complexity or additional traits than its provable ancestors. And I say provable, because people now say, well, what about the fossil record? Yeah, what about the fossil record? Has it ever occurred to you that God is a very clever designer and he can reuse and alter designs? If you find something in the fossil record that looks like a cross between a dinosaur and a bird, you can only make one of two conclusions. Either this thing shares a common ancestor with both a bird and a dinosaur, or God reused one of his designs. Now, this would make sense because we see many different animals have eyeballs. This is a common design. Does that necessarily mean we share a common ancestor just because we have a similar design? Absolutely not. So the next question would be, what about the cavemen? What about Neanderthals? What about Java Man and Piltdown Man? And all of these supposed missing links between humans and apes. Well, most of them are forgeries, some of them are just apes, and a lot of them are just old humans.
The Bible says people used to live to be over 900 years old, and the human brow ridge never stops growing. Plus, people can get arthritis. So imagine a 900-year-old person with arthritis. That would be what we consider a Neanderthal, even though they're just a human being. In fact, the Aborigines have abnormally large eye ridges, and they're not nearly that old, and yet they are just human beings. So, uh, we didn't come from apes. There's no evidence to suggest we did, even though they want there to be evidence, which is why they keep trying to find it and making clay mock-up statues. You know, you can make anything look like anything with enough clay. So, anyways, there goes evolution. End of story. That's it, guys. It's over. That's it, guys. God bless. If you want to get saved, click that link right there. Otherwise, check out my website, and I'll see you later. Thanks for watching. It started as a human. It ended as a, you guessed it, a human.